In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In an online article by Father Stephen Freeman, which is faithful to the church handed down from Christ to the Apostle, he writes, God is personal and therefore acts in freedom. We can know or perceive God because he makes himself known. By and large, people in our culture are looking for a God who can be experienced by the critical faculty. In short, we want a God whom we can consume. Do I like him? Do I want him? Will I give him my life? Do I choose him? This is largely accomplished, he goes on, by substituting the idea of God for God as God really is. Now, enter McLean's magazine Facebook page dated April 2019, quoting an article from their March 31st, 2008 edition, which reads, Jesus has an identity crisis, and some believers say the faith might be better off without him. Scholars and socialites and a growing number of the hoi polloi cast doubt on the divinity of Christ, even pondering if the church would be better off without him. Is this an obvious assault by some that profess to be Christians, or worse yet, the church assaulting the divinity of Christ Jesus? Well, in one way, this focuses on what some denominations uh, call a crisis of faith, saying they can no longer accept the Holy Scripture as the written word of God. Yet for the church, the Holy Scriptures are the greatest written source of truth, virtue, and for the teaching of doctrine and holiness. But for some denominations or even factions within denominations, accepting the Scripture as the written word of God is a quaint and outdated position at best, or foolish, or even dangerous. So what does this say about the reality of the receiving and interpreting of the Holy Scripture through the church and in the church? Especially when so-called experts attack and try to ruin the faithful church growing in the received faith by Holy Scripture and Holy Tradition. Is this not attacking Christ Jesus? I myself have heard such statements as these. Jesus' moral teaching is not really outstanding. It's impossible to create a moral high ground from his life, his work, and his words. The world has changed. We have evolved. We are more intelligent. We're more advanced. His word doesn't make sense anymore. His words are dead to many people anyway. So does this not mean Christ Jesus is out of date? Does this not mean that his words are empty, unable to have any effect on people? That's a big things that make you go, hmm. Oh, just think of this for a second. Christ Jesus, who preaches love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, and these have no value in our society? Well, I guess these folks are correct. Or maybe not. Do we need God's word from 20 centuries ago to guide us? After all, we have exalted, enlightened ideas of our own that are constantly weakened by having to hold them up to the received truth of the Holy Scripture and Holy Tradition, things that make you go, hmm. Perhaps the reason we need God's Word from 2,000 years ago, which in reality is timeless, is because we actually aren't getting better and better. 
Perhaps because we're not getting more intelligent. That we're not getting less self-centered and self-focused. Perhaps the reason we need God's word from 2,000 years ago is because in reality we are less loving. We are less joyful, less at peace, less patient, less kind with a growing deficiency in goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Perhaps the reason we need God's word from 2,000 years ago is because we desire to manufacture and consume our own truth, our own God, in our own minds, in our own way, in our own life, and yes, even in our own delusion yet claim that we are the sane ones. Perhaps the reason we need God's word from 2,000 years ago is because our deep desire has turned from union and communion with God, as God really is, and union and communion with our neighbor, and instead, as Father Tom Hopko wrote, we deeply desire to be simply consumers, calculators, and copulators. So I ask, is this the mystery of lawlessness that St. Paul wrote of to the church in Thessalonica? The mystery of lawlessness is working already. There is only the one at present restraining this. That means by divine decree, this mystery of lawlessness is being restrained or not anymore. God knows. Let those with ears hear. Nonetheless, this reality remains. The faithful church still answer with Simon Peter, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. This proclamation excludes all compromise with other religious notions and faith systems. So to profess other than this means what? Professing otherwise means that Christ Jesus does have an identity crisis. Professing other then you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, it means that Christ Jesus may no longer be relevant, that humanity has indeed progressed and surpassed any former need for Christ and his teaching, and have done so by our own human wisdom and insight. Actually, this has led to Christians without Christ. Now, this may be possible, in some people's minds, but is this the church? For calling oneself a Christian does not mean that the person is in the kingdom of God on earth, the one holy and apostolic church, any more than one being born in a bakery can claim to be a loaf of bread. Yet, Many scholars and pastors still call themselves Christians and teach that the Holy Scripture is bendable, context-based, meaning something different to different people at different times, or something different to different people at the same time, which means it's kind of all good. It's, it's relative. It it's, says what you would like it to say. And some teach that you don't actually have to believe in God, as God really is, but in a God as you understand God to be, or not. The truth then ceases to be a person and becomes an idea or an ideal. Some teach that miracles are mere fables, including Christ's miraculous birth and glorious resurrection and ascension, some deny Christ's divinity, or that Holy Communion is his precious body and blood. What, what, what to do? 
What now? Well, St. Peter speaks the truth in love again. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. And St. Paul adds, if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, and if you believe in your heart, your soul, that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. Well, some scholars and pastors teach to simply invite Jesus into your heart, you're saved forever. A hundred percent ironclad confident that you're heaven bound on the happy day express. But St. Paul's statement concerning confession of faith in Christ mean much more than verbal or intellectual assent, saying, if you believe God raised him from the dead, this is crucial for the church. For if Christ was not raised from the dead, our faith is in vain. Again, this means much more than saying, I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus' death and resurrection. I believe that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. There's more there. This means that Christ's divinity in his body, the church, is the pillar and bulwark of the truth. This means Christ is the way, the truth, the life, meaning he is who he is and he's not who he's not. A consumer Christianity or a philosophical Christianity can teach and preach an ideology or an idea about God. But the church must preach the eternal God man who says, if you have seen me, you have seen the father. That says those that endure to the end shall be saved. Why do we need to endure to the end if we're already in? Doesn't make sense. But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father has been working until now and I have been working. Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. This means that Christ's incarnate revelation of God of what God is like and what God wills for humankind supersedes any other human teaching of who God is. What God is like and what God calls humans to become or not. This means that all of Christ's teachings whether by word or deed, can be fully trusted and fully implemented by the grace of God. Or not. We are free to decide. But I ask you, my dear brothers and sisters, my dear friends, where did this freedom to decide come from? Christ Jesus' question remains, who do you say I am? 
the response of the faithful church now, today, at this moment, is identical without adding or subtracting, identical to the answer of the faithful and true church as St. Peter's answer 2,000 years ago. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God, the same yesterday, today, and forever. What, my dear friends, say you?